to Much Ado About Gaming. I am Jessa Rose, and today we have a very exciting show for you. We have the designers of Seastead here with us, Ian Cooper and Jane Gonzalez, and in a few minutes, they're going to talk to us all about that game, which we are so excited about. It's such a cool game. It's even got a really cool mod up on Tabletop Simulator that you can check out, so we'll talk about that in a couple minutes. But first, we have a very exciting new announcement, and I am going to let my friend V take it away and tell you all about our newest project with Wizards of the Coast. Hey, and welcome everyone. I'm Bee Muse with WizKids, and I'm here to share some exciting news with you all today. There is now a new way for DMs and players to get your hands on your favorite Dungeons and Dragons products by WizKids. Introducing Shop Dungeons and Dragons powered by WizKids, an all new online store offering a variety of D&D products perfect for your tabletop accessory needs. To visit the store now, simply type dndmini.com into your browser. Place pre-orders for upcoming releases. Search for that much wanted item to add to your current campaign. Even see what else is going on for all things D&D. Shop now and orders over $50 get free shipping in the US. Minimum purchase of $9.99 required for all orders. For those of you outside the US, please keep an eye out for future announcements about shipping options in your area. But that isn't all folks. For a limited time, orders of $100 or more will receive the exclusive Yeti Tyke promo, featuring three adorable pre-painted minis while supplies last. Get on over there today and check out all there is to offer. And don't miss out on your chance to receive the special promo of these fantastic miniatures just in time for the much anticipated release of the Icewind Dale Rime of the Frost Maiden campaign. Happy shopping! Wow, exciting, exciting. We're so excited for the new D&D mini website, but hello guys, Ian and Jan, how are you? Pretty good, thank you for having us. Thank you so much for being here. Ian, I realized yeah. I didn't get, a, get give you a chance to answer that question. <laughs> yeah, it's great to be here. Awesome, thank you so much. Well, we're so excited about Seastead. It's such a cool looking game. Um, I just kind of want to give the little spiel about it before we go into the interview, so I'm gonna really quickly talk through it. On an ocean world, even enemies must play fair. You and your rival compete for control of the four flotillas, the last remnant of old earth. Strike cunning deals, build stable ground, and clean the ocean. Then you will truly lead Seastead. So this is a two-player, I cut, you choose, resource collection and building game. Uh, and it is set in the world of Flotilla. 
Uh, so, Ian and Jen, why don't you just tell us about the design, what originally inspired it? You know, where, where how did it first come to you two? Um, yeah, I'll go ahead and I'll answer that. Um, so the, the game actually came from uh, Jan and I sitting down. Uh, we wanted to design a game, but we had no idea what we wanted to um, design together. We had uh, uh, never t collaborated together. Um, and uh, yeah, we just had no starting point. So we did something called, uh, um, what, you know, what we call uh, game design improv. Um, where basically we both took turns coming up with a one sentence rule and writing it down and selecting a, uh, a component. And we had a big, uh, big box of, you know, miscellaneous components. Uh, so we, uh, just started doing this back and forth. Mm -hmm. We had about 12 rules and, uh, that's about where we stopped. And uh, we immediately play tested to see if it if it even functioned, and uh, it did. And wow. uh, we, we really liked the direction. We decided that uh, that was the the core game that we wanted to uh, uh, to develop. So mm -hmm. we spent the next six months developing it, something like that. Um, yeah, uh, that's how it started. That's pretty amazing. You know, you just kind of throw stuff at the wall and it to have that kind of turn into something as awesome and interesting as Seastead is really exciting. I I imagine you didn't expect it to go as well as it did when you did that initially. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, in this case, it worked very well for us because Ian and I are, are, have very different design philosophies. Mm -hmm. uh, Ian is, is very virtual. Uh, he's very methodical, but he likes to do like big sweeping changes over time. <laughs> and I am like the opposite of that. Mm -hmm. Like I turn a square into a pentagon. Let's just add one side. <laughs> but that can be slow and mm -hmm. you could argue Ian might think it's boring too, right? Because you're, you're moving too slowly and, and you're not adding too much excitement. So, and the answer really is somewhere in between those two, right? So. Mm -hmm. For us, it's always been about ha finding that happy medium between big, sweeping, exciting changes that break things all the time mm -hmm. and then taking things maybe a at a slower cadence so that we can measure the different variables as we change them. Interesting. So, okay, so tell us a little bit more about kind of the process. So you do this design improv, you come up with this design that works and it works well, and you want to take that and make a full game out of it. So what are... What are the next steps there? What what were the what was kind of how did you move forward from that point? Um, well, we would have weekly. Uh, uh, this is before the before the pandemic, mm -hmm. but we were, we would have uh, weekly uh, uh, meetings, usually at my place, sometimes at his place, where we would uh, actually play with a physical prototype. Now mm -hmm. we now we're completely prototyping everything on uh digitally of course which is really weird but um <laughs> <laughs> so yeah we would do weekly weekly meetings uh to kind of play the game and mm -hmm. and just kind of discuss and then we would um we met on zoom a lot mm -hmm. um yeah and just just going back and forth um i i think that because we had i mean the 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 mechanics that really s stayed with us the whole time mm -hmm or the, the, the hexes, the flotillas. Yes. And that each each uh, side of the hex had a cost, uh, you know, incrementing all the way up to six. And uh, the idea that uh, the resources, each resource, each flotilla had one resource type, and then those resources would swap, <coughs> uh, swap me. throughout gameplay. Mm -hmm. And so, so with those, Oh, and we had three building types. Now the buildings right. changed and the powers changed and mm -hmm. a lot of the other things, you know, changed, but those, those core mechanics, the core idea that, uh, you're, you're, oh, and the dive card, actually the dive card started out as a bag. Mm -hmm. We had a bag and we had a bunch of resource chips and you would actually, um, draw, uh, you would take four out and give two to your opponent and mm -hmm. keep two. Right. And ultimately, you know, that, that felt, it, it slowed the game down, having to reach over and grab the bag 
And also it, it sometimes you would pull out resources and mm -hmm. the decision wasn't interesting. So uh, in order to make the gameplay faster mm -hmm. and uh, um, make the decision more interesting, we kind of came up with 12 decisions, each one being a card. So every single card forced you to make a painful and interesting decision. Right. Wow. So what would you say is the most then significant difference between the original design and the final design of the game that we're releasing? I can take that one to me. I think originally we did not have those demand tokens mm -hmm. at the center of each flotilla. They used to be like these big titans and they had some potentially game breaking but really cool and exciting powers. Mm -hmm. And it was all about area control in the flotillas there used to be islands before um, and then you know whoever controlled that island would be able to unleash that cool titan power on the opponent right and that we it was it was it wasn't always working like we wanted to so that was one of the biggest changes turning mm -hmm. those titans into what are now demand tokens and that determines the cost of building at that location as opposed to having a power that you're fighting to control over and then mm -hmm. once you do you probably crush your opponent <laughs> but nicely crush your opponent because you still want to yeah. try to work together a little bit even if you do kind of want to win that's right because you you need it you still need your opponent to help you right and feed your resources from what used mm -hmm. to be the bag that ian explained but you know you didn't want to help your opponent too much right mm -hmm. so it was always about that careful balance so that yeah. element of the game has always been there from the first the start and that seems really different for you know there are co-oppetitive games out there but it's not as common of of a, of a mechanical theme as say straight co-op or straight competitive and so having that kind of perfect blend of the two seems like it's it's definitely an important part of the game and i think it's what's the word i'm looking for it's really integral to what makes the experience so great for this game. So, um, what about, you know, were there any aspects of maybe your original design that you kind of wish had made it into the final game, but it just, you know, in editing, it just wasn't going to fit with the overall vision of the final game? Um, actually, I think, uh, the final game is the game we really wanted, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I don't think there was anything that hit the cutting room floor that, uh, like, we really uh, tried to get every concept that we really wanted into mm -hmm. that game. That's why I feel like the game's very dense. Yeah. Uh, it's got a lot of, of little mechanisms that mm -hmm. play off of each other. Um, so, no, uh, um, I, think, I think we got the game we really wanted to make. Mm -hmm. So... Then how did working on this game, how did that kind of differ from maybe previous games that you've both worked on? Yeah, so for me, this is my first uh, co-design. Mm -hmm. I've been designing games by myself um, for about four years before I started this process with Ian. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it, it's to me, it's like night and day. Uh, it, it It's really great to have a, a partner that you can count on. Yeah. Most of the time when you design a system in your mind, it, it's perfect, right? Like, mm -hmm. yeah, this is working perfectly. I don't need to make any changes. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, when you show it to someone who, who's got skills and experience and that you trust, mm -hmm. they're going to tear it apart. And your initial reaction, you're going to get protective and defensive, right? right? But you have to think that in the end, it's better for the product. Mm -hmm look at all those you know pain points and, and ga gaping holes mm -hmm. that are part of that design just so you can make it better right uh, so if you are able to deal with that in it initially can feel a little frustrating or like, mm -hmm. like oh you just don't understand my game uh, like that's what when you're designing a game by yourself that's how you, you should sometimes can feel mm -hmm. uh, you just don't understand you're just not playing it right but right you gotta consider that mm -hmm probably people out there aren't going to be playing it that way either. Yeah. So, but when you're co-designing, it's, it's a lot different because now both uh, both persons have a stake in the design. So mm -hmm. 
like for example if Ian suggests a system and I see flaws in there like I am going to tear it apart as much as I can and as Ian knows we've both done that to each other all the time <laughs> uh, but in mind you know you're just thinking about what what makes a better product in the mm -hmm. end more than the personal feelings are around those decisions absolutely Ian, how about you no that was a great answer <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, uh, I think uh, Jan and I said it earlier, uh, or Jan said it earlier when he said that uh, we, we, we approach uh, game design from very different mm -hmm. perspectives. Um, I tend to be very, uh, um, you know, a uh, 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 50,000 mile, you know, view, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, and I tend to really like to make big sweeping changes and, you um, you know, I do kind of pendulum swings, um, and and he's much more uh, iterative. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, I tend to like systems that are very uh, um, loose and yes. freeform. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a huge fan of uh, magic and and games that uh, uh, give you uh, a million choices and a million mm -hmm. ways to do some, do the same thing. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that Jan likes more structured gameplay. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that it's, it's, I love how he and I are able to come, come in together in the middle, basically mm -hmm. find that middle ground. Right. And I think we, I think we do it really well. I mm -hmm. mean, I really uh, uh, love working with Jan. He's, he's really good to work with. And if I have a concern, he listens and, you know, lets me like, uh, uh, play around with these mm -hmm. big these big changes but at the same time kind of you know uh uh says stop let's iterate here mm -hmm. you know? so it, it's it's great it's been a really really good design uh mm -hmm. experience that's yeah. awesome that's awesome to hear um if you're just joining us in the chat hello we are here with uh Ian Cooper and Jan Gonzalez, the designers of Seastead, our upcoming game set in the world of Flotilla. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to post them in the chat and I will pass them along to Ian and Jan. Um, we're just kind of hearing more about their design process and what inspired the game and it's been really interesting. It's going to be continue to be interesting, so please feel free if you have any questions. Um, so you're obviously a two-person team designing this game, which is a two-player game. So did you find it easier to maybe progress on your work with this design because you had the option of playing the game one-on-one -on -one with each other as opposed to, you know, having to find a play test group every time you would create a new iteration? Yeah, absolutely. So I think from the start, that was one of our constraints. Mm -hmm. Let's make a game that's designed about being two players. Uh, sometimes you'll play a game, right? And there's a player count that you know the game plays best at mm -hmm. um it's it, not always but sometimes you play a game and you're like well this plays so much better with x players you know two players or four players so we said let's just do it through two player mm -hmm. and that's gonna be it uh and from the start that kind of framed the scope of the product right mm -hmm. and then we started thinking okay what makes a good two-player game mm -hmm. um, and that's you know from that starting point it evolved a lot more naturally uh, of course, the nature that it's a two-player team and we could play test it between each other definitely helped. Mm -hmm. That being said, we did uh, test it with others. Uh, that's something very important. We don't want any kind of tunnel vision uh, to mm -hmm. be present in the process. So we have other uh, friends and family, of course, that tested the game out. Mm -hmm. uh, we did gather a lot of good feedback from that, but mm -hmm. the bulk of the initial play testing, it was between the two of us. And the fact that we framed it that way, it, it really helped spark the, the process and, right. and make it really, really quick. Like Ian said, mm -hmm. we only designed it for about six or seven months before we pitched it to, to Zeb. That's an incredible turnover time too for a design. Um, you know, you have designers working on their games for years. And so having a six month period where you're like, um, you know, it's done, it's like awesome. And really, it's it's a it's a testament to your skill as designers, I think. Um, so, what parts of the final game are you each kind of most proud of? Like, what is like this is my absolute. I love this. It's so great, and I'm so happy that it's in this game. 
Um, yeah, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll start. Um, so my partner and I play a lot of, uh, a lot of two player games, uh, and we, we really like the heavier Euro games. Mm -hmm. And, um, one thing that uh, I had noticed is there just aren't, I mean, you can take a big heavy Euro game mm -hmm. uh, and play it as a two player game, but because it was designed from the, you know, from the ground up to be a four player game, it just, it lacks that head to head uh, um, competition. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I really love about this game is that it is, you know, uh, I, I would think of it as kind of a medium uh, medium weight euro mm -hmm. uh, that's really head to head mm -hmm. and and, uh, um, and it packs dilemmas in every decision like every single uh, action you know mm -hmm. even even just choosing what action you're going to take am I going to dive or am I going to build is a dilemma right you know where I'm going to build is a dilemma every single action in the game mm -hmm. is a choice and it's kind of a double-edged sword mm -hmm. you're you're always helping yourself and you're always hurting yourself too or or helping your opponent uh which is also hurting yourself um <laughs> you know if you if you build into the wrong area if right. you build into an area uh that you really want to build in you're mm -hmm. also leaving areas open that your opponent it, it's such a tight game and there's mm -hmm. always a sense of uh painful decisions to to be made mm -hmm. and and that's that that makes the gameplay experience for me really enjoyable and really mm -hmm. really tense and um yeah really really uh interesting yeah just to add to what ian said mm -hmm. uh, like he you know like Ian it put it, I'm always watching what my opponent is doing during their turn. And that's something that's very important in this game. Mm -hmm. You don't see that in too many games. Uh, sometimes you just kind of tune out or you're planning your next turn. Right. In Sista, you are definitely watching like a hawk what your opponent is mm -hmm. doing. And one of my favorite things in Sista is the, uh, the dock tiles. So when you build a, a port, which is one of the buildings you can build in the game, mm -hmm. you get to choose to place a dock tile in front of it. And then that is going to give points to the player that places certain buildings around that port tile, either two spaces to the left, mm -hmm. one space to the left, one space to the right, or two spaces to the right. So as, as soon as my opponent puts one of those down, I'm already changing my strategy to, to try to take those points away from my opponent. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes it it's good to put those down early on, mm -hmm. but then you're running the risk of your opponent leveraging that and taking it down right. and taking the points away from you. Mm -hmm. That's that's one of my favorite mechanisms, and definitely I'm always trying to take duck tiles away from Ian. From Ian. <laughs> um, so one thing I do want to talk about, and for our audience members who've kind of been watching these cycling images off to the right, uh, you can see that the game is available to play on Tabletop Simulator, which is really cool because it gives players the opportunity to try out the game in advance of release in its kind of complete state, even if it's not a physical copy. Uh, so let's talk about what was the process like of just adapting the game's design for a platform like Tabletop Simulator? Yeah, I'll take that one. Uh, so before this whole world <laughs> event happened, uh, I had only delved in tabletop simulator. Mm -hmm. I didn't like a lot of people out there. Initially, it, it can take time to adjust. Mm -hmm. So, but when we started uh, Seastead, we and this whole pandemic started, we needed to devise a way to continue our development process. Right. So Ian and I decided to take a stab at it, mm -hmm. and we just uh, threw the assets together. We put it together pretty quickly, and that sped up our development process significantly mm -hmm. uh, because we could iterate much faster that way. Right. Uh, in our case, when that happened, we already had all of the assets mm -hmm. in a format that would be easy to import into Tabletop Simulator. Mm -hmm. So we didn't have to scramble and, and put together all the assets. Uh, we already had them. So mm -hmm. that definitely helped uh, jumpstart the process. Right. And from that point on, it was just about putting it together, packaging, 
packaging it, sharing it with friends, and mm -hmm. getting some feedback. Awesome. I haven't had a chance to play it on Tabletop Simulator yet. Of course, I have my own copy right here. There you go. So, uh, but I have seen video and images of the Tabletop Simulator version. It's really cool. The background behind Jan, actually, is the background on Tabletop Simulator. So it's very thematic. It definitely immerses you in the world of Flotilla and, of course, Seastead. Um, I should mention about these images and the components on the right. The components are not waterproof. <laughs> Um, the images, of course, are just for flavor and fun. Uh, please don't try playing this in water. Uh, the components aren't waterproof, but, um, yeah, the Tabletop Simulator Edition looks really cool. And if you want to check that out on Tabletop Simulator, you can go into the Steam Workshop for Tabletop Simulator, search Seastead, and it's right there. It's really easy to find. Download it, play it fall in love with it just like you know all of us have fallen in love with it so uh you two are of course the experts in this game you designed it uh if someone came to you and said how do i how do i win how do i be the best at possible at this game what tips would you give them i'll let you yeah, yeah. jam's the better better seastead player okay, fine. <laughs> <laughs> So I'll start then I'll give you a chance because we have tr actually have different strategies, different mm -hmm. ways we approach the game. Uh, in my case, it's, I mentioned before the ports and the dock tiles, mm -hmm. uh, because those also give you an end game points depending on how many resources you have left at right. the end of the game. So to me, it's about balancing when to put those down, mm -hmm. when to capitalize on my opponent's dock tiles so that I can get points from their tiles mm -hmm. and also the dock tiles that I do place down try to get as many end game points out of those as I can mm -hmm. and then based around that I look at what the specialists are available that can help me towards those goals mm -hmm. uh, so if I see specialists that let me move things around or or like move buildings around or maybe give me more resources that I can then keep till the end of the game to get mm -hmm. points that's usually what I try to do. Awesome. Ian, how about you? Uh, lately, I've been trying uh, a strategy where I, I, I try to get momentum uh, going with my resources. Mm -hmm. So I've been diving early, right. um, which you really should never dive unless you really have to. But um, uh, because when you dive, you can kind of control what resources you're getting, what your opponent's getting. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I try to build up some resources quickly, go for those higher uh, uh, flotilla spaces. Mm -hmm. There's spaces that give you uh, two resources uh, of your choice or three resources mm -hmm. of your choice. And if you can get those early and then uh, follow through using those resources kind of to fuel your way, uh, um, you, you can be, once you have that, you can kind of, it'll kickstart uh, your your kind of your momentum and mm -hmm. you can sometimes build you know three buildings or four buildings uh, without or or even more uh, um, and, and once you get a, a one of those spaces mm -hmm. uh, that give you a lot of resources you can try to continue getting the the higher cost spaces that right. uh, but then also if your opponent is playing uh, you know, smart, they mm -hmm. can do things to cut you off. And then you'll end up in a situation where you're, you're like, Oh, I got all these resources and nowhere to spend them. So, um, yeah, it's, it's tricky. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, and just to add to what Ian said, yeah, I would argue towards the end of the game, diving becomes more important mm -hmm. because at that point, most of the cheap spots are taken. So mm -hmm. giving an opponent one resource, is probably okay, especially if you see that they are not going to get endgame points for it, but you could get endgame points right. from the other side of the card. Mm -hmm. Right. So, for example, if you manage to put down dock tiles that give you points for green kelp, mm -hmm. and your opponent doesn't, or they likely don't, so at that point you can dive and get all the kelp for yourself and give them stuff that's worth not, not many points for them. Gotcha. Yeah. I, I, just to add, you know, I think like diving can be um, really good and mm -hmm. at the same time really bad. But 
it's it's only bad when it's not a choice. Mm -hmm. Like when your opponent uh, positions themselves in a way which forces you to dive, then you're basically uh, really kind of getting hurt. Uh, when you get to choose the time to dive, mm -hmm. uh, um, it, it's much better for you. So you can, right. you, you know, it's always better to be the one choosing to take mm -hmm. that action than, than having that action forced on you. Yeah, that makes total sense. So, okay. Big question. <laughs> Other than Seastead, what is your favorite WizKids game? For me, it's Mage Knight. Of course. <laughs> Everyone loves Mage Knight. Uh, I really like The Expanse. Oh, wow. That's a great game. The Expanse is great. We had Jeff on just last week, actually, talking about Super Skill Pinball. Um, so, yeah, both games are really great. Mage Knight's awesome. And The Expanse is also awesome. Guys, thank you so much for being here on the show. Uh, I really appreciate it. I'm sure that our audience also really appreciates hearing more about this game. Is there anything else you want to mention? Of course. No, thanks for having us once again. And I hope people enjoy the game. Have fun playing it. Thank you, Ian. Yeah, thanks for having us. This is great. Great. Thank you so much, guys. Uh, I'm just going to mention one more thing before we go. Uh, we have a contest going on right now for Super Skill Pinball 4K. You could win a free copy of the game signed by the designer. Um, and that way that you enter this contest is you want to message us on Facebook with your favorite pinball memory. That contest closes today at midnight, so get your entries in if you want a chance to win a free signed copy of the game. Again, just message us on Facebook with your favorite pinball memory. You could win a free signed copy of Super Skill Pinball 4K. And before I go, don't forget to watch uh, V's show tomorrow, Mini Mayhem, at noon. Uh, she's going to show off some great minis from our line, and definitely check it out. Thank you everyone so much for watching. Thank you to Jan and Ian again for coming on the show. Have a wonderful week, everyone. Bye.